Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akio, and if you're interested in ChatGPT, personal projects, and working in a team versus working by yourself, today's episode is for you. Joining me today is Forrest Knight. He's a content creator, software engineer, and he loves combining software and history in software history. Fun little tidbit, he built a personal project that shoots him whenever he's not as productive as he wants to be. I'll put all his links to his socials in the description below. Check him out. And with that being said, enjoy the episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he showed something really cool in, he made like a mock-up design on paper, got a video of yeah. it, and before then he already created a bot that was going to read stuff from Discord and interpret it. So he then just uploaded the picture to Discord and it pooped out the HTML and JavaScript for like the mock-up website of it. Uh, yeah. And then he pasted it in like wow. a code snippet tool and it looked pretty decent, looked exactly like what he wanted. Uh, and it even interpreted like his writing because he has he had like okay click on this make a joke something like that. Yeah. That was pretty impressive actually. It's 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 just going to continue to get more and more impressive as we go because the way I see it is going to be more plugged into how developers use AI. Yeah. Like I literally just made an entire video. I haven't released it, but I recorded it mm. and completely swapped my opinion on how it will affect programming jobs. Yeah. Whereas at first I'm like, no, nah, it'll just make programmers more efficient. But as I did more and more research, I'm like, nah, it's, it's me personally. I think it's going to actually have a lot of these programming jobs decline yeah. over time, Yeah. That's, which I can go into full detail on that, but that's a whole bag of worms. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, that's what some of my colleagues, they're like already now, it can do a lot of like powerful stuff. So if they keep improving yeah. this, if I don't know what the number was, but if they like a hundred X or 10 X, like increase the model in intelligence, that's already yeah. a big increase in that way. And I've only used it because I messed up one of my linting rules or something like that. And I had to uppercase everything instead of camel case it. So then I was like, yeah, right, ChatGPT fix this for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially all of those. Like, if you need to change something that's super redundant or repetitive, it can just do it just like that. But also, like with refactoring and whatnot, and then just kind of getting you that more in depth, what I would call boilerplate code. Yeah. Be instead of just trying to start everything from scratch or what have you, just like you would use like Create React app to to kind of build out the app, uh, boilerplate, if you will. But it's more in depth than like traditional boilerplate. Yeah. ChatGPT and other tools, you know, like OpenAI Codex plus GPT-4 is kind of what ChatGPT uses in order to formulate the code. Codex is also what's behind uh, GitHub Copilot and whatnot. And then obviously these other companies are building their own version of Codex and GPT. And that's what's like, that's what will allow you to be able to do those types of things. Interesting. I mean, you've definitely done more research on this than I have. So I'm wondering what made you change that perspective? Because I also think it's going to be more so a productivity tool. Like I can see it being very powerful. Yeah. But I don't know if it's going to make jobs obsolete. I think it's going to evolve jobs into something else. But you're saying it might actually replace a lot of things also. Yes. Because, because and, and it's funny because what I found out as I was doing the research are exact like counterpoints to my initial argument. Mm. Uh, so where I think is going to come into play is like what I mentioned earlier is how uh, it's going to be plugged into everything, like your entire workflow. Just think about what, how you perform a task as a software engineer. I, it defers, but I'm going to talk from my own personal experience. You know, you start a sprint. So what happens when you start a sprint? Let's say it's two, three weeks sprint. Your team gets together. You pull in the user stories, break those down into tasks, pull in other tasks and whatnot from the backlog and everything. And then you go through all of them are titled so you have a broad understanding of what to do. But what we did was go in to each individual one and give a description, more information about what needs to be done for this task, yeah. right? And then once you do that, okay, Everyone is assigned or chooses the tasks that they are to work on next. They pull it over to in progress. They work on that, do done, go to the next. And then they complete all of those tasks over the two, three week sprint. Yeah. So a lot of these tasks are, you know, implement a feature, or fix a bug, or maybe even in there you throw in like, a, you know, fixing code smells, code coverage, things of that nature, writing tests. Obviously you have to do all of that. 
and I, the reason why I thought that it wasn't going to be like taking or, 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 or yeah, replacing programmers at all, because somebody needs to go in and tell the AI what to write. Yeah. Like, hey, we need to get this done, right? The AI writes it, it writes tests for it. And then the, let's say the junior developer does that. And the junior developer looks at the code, tests the code, you know, creates a feature branch. And then what do they do after that? They, once everything works, then they submit a pull request and then it goes to someone else or multiple other people for a code review. Make sure, okay, this looks good. Or yep. maybe you need to change that or change this. Well, if you're already determining at the beginning of the sprint, what needs to be done, which is basically the same exact sentence that you would enter into the AI and the AI would spit out code. Yeah. And then the AI is going to write the test. And if it's already plugged in, so this is how I see it. If inside your issue tracking software, project management software, whatever, instead of assigning it to me, you'd assign it to the AI. And that's what triggers the AI to go ahead and do it. And if it's already plugged into that, it'll be plugged into your version control system. So then it will write the code, write the tests, and then commit and push it, creating a new feature branch to then be pu uh, pulled over or pushed, you know, as a pull request over to the development branch. That's how mine was structured up. Yeah. The development branch where everyone's features on this sprint are going to that are waiting for a code review anyway. Mm -hmm. So you already lay out the description that the AI would need at the beginning of the sprint. And you already need to review the code regardless of whether a junior developer or whoever writes the code as it gets pulled into the development branch. So I thought the junior developer was going to be the one that had to plug it into that workflow, but it looks like it's already being done. Yeah. And then all it needs to do as it gets more and more advanced is have the ability to plug into these systems, all of the tools that you use as a software engineer. There will need to be some oversight, but all of these simple mundane tasks are, I mean, what does a junior developer do? Everything that the senior developer doesn't want to do. Hmm. So, I mean, the senior developer can already do it, right? But they just have, you know, it, it's more efficient. Like they have bigger fish to fry. It's more efficient for the junior developer to, to do it. And they focus on the big picture over here. So why not just have the AI write the code? They can write it just as good, if not better, especially within the next five years, than a junior developer. Yeah. There's one slight uh like missing piece here and that is well what happens when the senior dev or whatever leaves or retires? Like typically that's the junior dev is who you work your way work their way up into that position, but maybe just like everything else, the uh structure uh, the skill gap will will rise for those types of jobs or I really believe that the entire landscape for those types of jobs will drastically change because senior devs and, and people will still be using uh, these tools as well to help them out. It's just a lot of these project management and, and those types of jobs to kind of maintain the code base and put together this written, all of that will need to be done. That's why I think it'll programming jobs will end up declining over the next five, I'll, I'll say 10 years to be safe sure. because a lot of players have to come together However, GitHub already has like all of these tools together. Well, I'll say Microsoft because they have VS code. They have GitHub has all of their different types of like issue tracking and project management and CICD and obviously version control. So it'll be interesting to see. The more I research it, the more I think that it's programmers may not be as safe as I initially thought. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Let's just say that. Like I, I've never heard it laid out like that, but the way you lay it out, if it's plugged into the workflow and it can get the information that it needs to to develop a feature, just like how a developer mm -hmm. would, then it's essentially part of a team. Like it's just another team member within that team, except the big difference is that is then your 10x developer or 100x, whatever you yeah. want to label it. Because output- Yeah, and it'll wise, have to be plugged into everything, yeah. just like everything else is. I mean, what isn't connected in, inside your workflow today? Like, like your entire virtual control system is connected into your IDE, all of your extensions and everything, all the tools that you use are in your IDE. And then your CICD gets automatically done and that gets pushed up to you. Like everything is basically automated. Every manual piece, it's just all connected regardless. Yeah. So why wouldn't the AI be connected as well? I mean, we already have extensions and whatnot, but I mean, even more 
connected and more in depth, just like I would be connected into the system, the AI would be connected to the system. And I'm obviously using AI as a more broad term, sure. but I, I think I think you get the idea. Yeah, interesting. The hard part for me is that then let's see let's say this happens and the trend of junior developers not necessarily doing those mundane tasks anymore but working more mm -hmm. with the senior developers on complex stuff hopefully that is then going to excel their learning curve but the problem is those mundane yeah. tasks there still needs to be an understanding of what is actually happening because as soon as the ai messes up or makes a mistake and there's no like human interaction or review process then we really rely on this piece of software writing a piece of software basically uh, with all the bugs involved yeah. in there. And that might be scary if your business is heavily reliant on that piece of software like most digital companies nowadays are. So it's going to bring, I think, a lot yeah. of risks involved in there as well. But still, the possibilities from a productivity point of view, I think, are going to be incredible. Then it's just going to evolve what a programmer yeah, does, yeah, yeah. I think, more on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, to push back on that a little bit, why can't the AI use the same linters that we use or code analysis software that we use and again when you when it submits the pull request the code has to be reviewed anyway yeah and i think it'll just get to, right now obviously you know you can see what it could do it could do a lot of good things but there needs to be human intervention right now but you know look at how much it's progressed over the past five years and in the and, it, and it's kind of like a compound progression so i see it progressing even more yeah. in the next five years so this, this thing, I don't know if it's already better coder than me. Mm. Or I'm, I'm, you know what? Coder is too simple of a term. I, yeah. Well, maybe better coder than me, but I think eventually it'll be a better software engineer than me. Yeah. And that's what everything I laid out and all the tools and all the workflow that that goes into it. Interesting. That's that. Yeah, that's what I find incredibly interesting. I, I, there still will be a market. There'll be jobs open as people leave. There will be more companies coming up and people needing to fill those spots but i could see like the whole like a lot of developers maybe kind of taking the role of uh i don't know like software app arch uh, uh, uh main maintainer it's like or, orchestrator or something like that I, feel like. I mean <laughs> yeah just orchestrator you just kind yeah. of pulling the strings i mean if you look at like if i look at my own experience when i started out like i didn't do computer science in university so i started it out in operations i did have some data science in in college and whatnot but then from that operations role, I got my first developer job. And it was basically mm -hmm. a junior developer role. I sat with consultancies who I now work at the same consultancy company, coincidentally. Uh, but their task was nice. to <laughs> sub, like uh, transfer as much knowledge to me as they could because they were going to offboard, basically. So I had a huge mm -hmm. ramp up in understanding of what we actually did and how to build on top of that. But for me, I thought initially so much about okay, I have this task, exactly how you describe it. There's going to be requirements. There's going to be new features, new requests. You're going to have to implement mm -hmm. it. You're going to look at what we have and how you do it. Right? How do you make this thing happen in the first place? And then as I got more experience with that, probably mundane tasks, less mundane tasks, doesn't really matter. You get a better fundamental understanding of how to do the things. But then what you're describing, the essence, I think, of a software engineer and probably the contribution is going to be what are we doing in the first place? Not necessarily how, and especially mm -hmm. why we're doing it, right? That fundamental business understanding, does this add value in comparison to the other things we can also do? Maybe your productivity yeah. is going to be so high that you can just try everything, which would be an ideal scenario. Uh, but I think the role is going to evolve more towards that, just as like your kind of junior to media to senior position uh, also gets more complex with regards to what and why. Yeah, there's always going to be a need for somebody in between like the end user, whoever needs that software, that app and the code or AI itself. Yeah. Just like, you know, there are plenty of freelancers who go about uh, building Wix websites and Squarespace websites like the business owner can absolutely do that themselves, but they ain't got the time to do that. Yeah. It makes more sense for them to deploy money in order to hire somebody who can just, you know, whip it up and, and kind of maintain the website regardless of how they get that website done. Mm. And then now they have a website and they, you know, they don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So there's always going to be a need for like somebody or people in between, but also to like look at like the bigger vision as well. But how many of, you know, developers in a team are 
looking at the bigger vision and how many are just kind of like, here, let me do this task. Yeah. Let me do this task. And some people, some people love one where they look at, like maybe they work on their own projects and they love to be able to work with this and work with that. Other people love to just be told, do this task, do that task. Thank you. Let me disappear at my computer code. Don't have to worry about anything. And that's that. They don't have to worry about the big picture. They don't have to worry about talking to the client or, or QA testing or anything like that. They just focus on the tasks. But the people who focus on the tasks, it'll start off as using AI for productivity and again, working all that out. Yeah. But I do see a lot of that kind of uh, almost becoming obsolete. But I do I do definitely understand what you're talking about with the bigger picture and, and talking with like the end user or client or whoever. Yeah. yeah. Well, for me, it's interesting is something you touched on in like apps like Squarespace or even I would say more low code platforms that already have like yeah. building blocks and people can like click and drag and drop and create their own application because that essentially you can do that with chat GPT and be even more flexible because you're not going to have the limitations mm -hmm. of that platform, right? If we're talking about low code, mm -hmm. there's always this like ramp up in productivity until you hit a point where the platform you're using doesn't do what you want it to do because you want something super custom. You're obviously a snowflake, so you want this thing and you think it's gonna add a lot of value. Yeah. And then you hit a wall and then you're like, oh, we have to yeah. make a, a custom building block or a plugin. And then at some point you make your own monstrosity, but the platform you're building on top of, it is a backbone within your architecture. So you cannot get rid of it. I don't think you're gonna have the same issues with chat GPT. It's probably flexible enough to then shift and be like, oh, have you thought of this? Or it's going to give you multiple options. So I think if you find yourself using those tools, more low code related, more click and drag and drop build tools, or even if you are an organization that is building that right now, for me, that would be a huge red flag, what ChatGPT is kind of providing or will provide for the future. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah, the, I can agree more with that. That's the main concern. I mean, you research whatever the hell you want because you're working now full-time on content creation. And I think that's really yep. admirable. <laughs> ChatGPT is a hot one. So I get that you would research that, but I also saw that you do, you did few videos on Linux and even other stuff mm -hmm. and whatnot. Like how do you decide on a topic to then do your research on to create content for? Sometimes it's a hard one where I'm trying to figure out like, what do I want my next video to be? Or there's times like right now where I have an entire list of videos I want to mm -hmm. create, but I go through like, the thing is I go through different phases, like like most of the last year, not every video, but a lot of videos were like project-based videos, where I, cause I really wanted to get in and, and just code projects, whether it be like a terminal website or a portfolio website, or like a using object detection and face tracking to get a Nerf gun on a, on a, like a swivel arm yeah. uh, to, to shoot me in the face <laughs> when I get distracted. <laughs> that was one of my favorite videos, but, uh, some of these other videos, like I, right now, I'm really liking the whole video essay thing. I'm still trying to uh, cater to a lot of my audience who may be new programmers or just want to know about like tools and things about software engineering and things of that nature. But a lot of what I, I've covered a lot of that stuff already. Yeah. And since I'm not a current software engineer, like, you know, in a team and whatnot, my knowledge is not growing like it did when I was, mm. because I'm just, it's growing in like, solo developer space, if you will, because I'm working on my own projects and you learn a lot doing that as well. But right now, like I love history. Mm. I love like computer science. So computer science history. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I made the, like one of my recent videos, like you mentioned about Linux is the making of Linux and kind of like the origin story of Linux and kind of where it is today, basically the entire story in between those two things yeah. and then i have a handful of other ones like one that's on the chopping block or not chopping block one that's going to be next or the one after next is about the ibm pc mm. which i think was like the first mainstream computer i don't know i wrote i wrote the script a little while ago <laughs> i have to go back and and, and, no problem. and get, i have to go back and edit <laughs> <laughs> that and that's kind of what i do is i dive deep into research this one, I actually had help with the initial research. That's why I don't have all of it. But all my other videos is me doing all the research yeah. and th because I really enjoy that aspect. I, I really love research. I love going down the rabbit holes. I love being able to spend all the time into just learning about Linux or uh, 
Alan Turing's 1936 paper where he introduced the universal Turing machine and kind of how that came about and kind of all these different players and pieces that tie into everybody else's story. Nice. It's just fascinating to me. So I love to do the research and then I learn so much more about it and then I get to make a video about it. Yeah. Like that's just ideal for me. So that's kind of where I'm at now and, and how I come about with some of those content ideas is whatever I'm interested, and you can see it throughout my channel, whatever I'm interested at the time, I try to keep it towards, mm -hmm. you know, computer science and software engineering, sometimes it'll trickle out, but whatever I'm interested at the time within that, or want to work on at the time within that, or something new that I learned, I want to share it. And I tried my best to make a good video about it. Yeah. And that's really, that's really how I come up with those ideas. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of similarities with podcast topics I have in there. I try and be oh, yeah. like somewhere in between, but the name is broad enough for me to do anything virtually. <laughs> So I have to yeah. I have to contain <laughs> kind of the topics what I think still makes sense within the boundaries I set myself. Uh, exactly. But yeah, you do feel like you trend outwards towards that. I I want to zoom in on kind of the relationship you have then with programming because you just like me were before you started go, to go content creation full time. You were a programmer at a company, and as you mentioned, mm -hmm. you worked in sprints. You did you picked up your featured requests and you created features for that. Uh, and yeah. I do that as well, but. I'd like I do consultancy 95% of the time. I wouldn't say that's software development 95% of the time, but it's a huge chunk of my time insofar yeah. that when I'm not working, I don't want to pick up a keyboard and make my own projects anymore. Like the, the Nerf yeah. gun example, shooting you in the ass, that, that to me is hilarious. And I, I, would, <laughs> I would love to do that. But then I'm like, when? Like I've lost kind of my touch or my drive to build those personal projects because I do that. That's my day to day yeah. basically. Have you seen that evolve since you've gone full content creation, full-time content creation? Yeah, absolutely. When, Cause when I was working, so here's the thing. When I was, so when I was working full-time as a software engineer, there was also the aspect that I did have the YouTube channel as well. Mm. So that was also more work on top of it. But even if I didn't have that, after coding for six hours a day, yeah. you know, it's, it's eight hour work day, but we're expected to do six, hours worth of tasks because on the task you know you estimate the time maybe a one hour task one two, two hour task and one three hour task that's six hours of task and that's what i have to get done that day after i do and even during doing that i'm like man i'm i'm about fried like yeah. i've made videos and, and talked to people about how like four hours of like deep coding not like research like we talked about into something or you know kind of mundane easy coding but like deep coding, problem solving, that type of stuff. Four hours is about my limit per day. Yeah. Six hours was insane. The last thing I want to do is come home and code even more because there's other things that I enjoy doing. And not only that, but my brain is like fried, melted at, at the end of the day, yeah. fried completely. So I just kind of didn't really code that much when I was working as a software engineer on my own projects, mm. but after I did. Now, I didn't tell, like initially when I left that job, I didn't mention on my YouTube channel because I knew, I knew. Luckily, I had enough insight that I was going to want to take it easy. I'd been working way too much for like the previous like three to four years overall, just like working and then coming home for like hang out and dinner for like two, three hours and then going back to work for, until like 1 or 2 a.m. Yep. and then getting up at 7 a.m., 8 a.m. the next morning and doing it all again. I'm like, all right, my whole goal is to try to be able to work for myself, be able to build what I want, make the videos that I want. I know I'm going to want to be able to like chill for a little bit. So that's what I did. So it didn't initially start me just coding my own projects. So I'm like, I'm going to take a little bit of, of a break from coding. Yeah. And that's what I did until, so that was 2019. And then in 2020, I started working on like, some machine learning stuff like mm. rebuilding Tetris and building a neural net and doing a lot of research in, in that and building a neural net, not even a library, <laughs> building my own neural net in order to beat Tetris yeah. or beat Tetris is kind of an interesting term, but get like a million points in Tetris. Yeah. And then I build a few other games after that and then kind of step back because I wanted to be able to make more content. And then in uh 20, 2021, I made some projects. I did. But then in 2022, I made a handful of projects like the ones we were just talking about. So the more 
I'm able to work on my own projects, the more I enjoy coding, which yeah. I feel like, again, and, and what's funny is that's not true for everybody. Like we were talking about earlier, some people just want to get tasks and just want to be able to do those tasks and not worry about the bigger picture. See, I like looking at the entire thing and building the entire thing myself. And, and at that point I'm good. So it definitely changed from when I was a software engineer to now where, you know, full-time content creator, if you will, to, from uh, personal projects to, or not working on personal projects to really enjoying the personal projects. Yeah. There are always those, you know, hard parts where it's annoying and you're like, this sucks and I, can I just stop this? But <laughs> you're so far in, sometimes you do just like bail on it. I'll come back to it and then you never do. But, you know, you know there's always going to be that. But what, what's the expression? Anything worthwhile is never easy or something like that. Mm. So that's kind of what you have to keep in mind for some of these things. Like you, whenever you hit a barrier, that doesn't mean you just quit. You just kind of try to figure out how to work your way through that barrier in order to get that done. Because that's like, that's like that gratification. Yeah. Once you get through that barrier and once you complete that project that you set out to complete, oh man, it feels so good. That's what makes coding exciting. So yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, from a sense of like ownership perspective also, these are your projects, right? And usually when you're working at a client or a company, you're working for someone else's software and sure you can feel ownership yeah. of that. But at the end of the day, some important decisions you might not get to make. Now that is different yeah. when you're working on your own projects. You can be like, I wanna do this because it's gonna be mine. And this is what I want right now. This is my yeah. itch and I wanna scratch it by creating whatever I wanna create. And that's gonna be different when you're working in a team, working on a project on something else. Like you have to find, yeah. I feel like, different drivers, different motivations. For me, a big driver is always like impact on customers and, and delivering value with the things that we build. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be me, it can be the output of the team. Uh, and however I contribute to that output, like I, I find enjoyment in, and that is where my value lies as well. But I can see that at some point, if you move on from this thing and you go off on your own, that you might find enjoyment in then your own projects as well. Like I think right now for me, mm just like you previously, when I'm done, I wanna do other stuff just because I don't get the opportunity to do so. But if you have the freedom to pick up whatever you want, whenever you want to, and even come back when things get tough and you need a little time break, uh, I think on a regular job, those time breaks you, you don't have or they don't offer them to you. But when you're off on your own, you do have that, which also- But there- it, Go ahead. But there is like a huge uh, upside to working with a team yeah. and working on a bigger project. Cause you're working on something that you can never work on by yourself. Like some of these, you know, the, I, I was working on a enterprise application mainly for my last job. And that is something I'm never going to build by myself. No. You know what I mean? Like I was so used to, uh, so I, I did full stack. So I did like, you know, like TypeScript on the front end, Java on the back. And I also did like some database and SQL stuff and whatnot. But the, uh, with Java in spring, like that's, that was my expertise, if you will. I'm sure. not saying I'm an expert in it, but for my skill level, that's what I was best at. And then I like look at some of these personal projects and there are like management systems and things that are good to build with Spring, but there are, there are so many other better tools mm. out there for the smaller projects yeah. than what I knew best, which kind of was unfortunate because then I had to learn all this new <laughs> technology and all these other frameworks and all this and then and whatnot. But not only that, when you work on a big, in a team, and this is one reason why I do really like tools like J uh, chat GPT is because it kind of gives me a, another head to bounce ideas off of. Yeah. Like, like a whereas team when you work in a, t it's a team member. Yeah. So when you worked in a team, uh, at least, especially for me, I had two amazing developers who I worked under and you know, it's funny is like how a lot of people are like, oh yeah, all developers, you know, they use Google and Stack Overflow and this and that. I'm sure they did too, but it seemed like their head yeah. was Stack Overflow. Like everything was downloaded in it and they just, I'm like, hey, I'm facing this problem and that problem and this and that. And I've tried this and I've tried that. And they're like, oh yeah, you just have to do this, this and that. I'm like, trying to do this, this and that, and then I do it. And then uh, sure enough, that's exactly what I needed to do. And they knew it off the top of their head. I'm like, that's insane. Yeah. That is something that I 
absolutely missed. Not just with them helping me out, but them mentoring me and kind of guiding me along and how much you can learn from somebody like like them. Plus the camaraderie of everyone working on the same thing. There are things that I miss about that, but not enough to go back. <laughs> but it definitely is something that that yeah. there are pros and cons to everything. Exactly. And those are definitely some of the pros. Yeah, I mean, especially the way you describe it. I, I have those people in my team now. And I feel like if I didn't have those people in my team, I would feel an itch to kind of move towards a team where I did have that, right? Because mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. you can offer that to someone else and someone else can offer that to you. But if you lose that, then kind of the value of being in that team diminishes to some point. Because mm -hmm. exactly as you mentioned, I know uh, probably of my company, a lot of people that can offer that to me in different various domains, right? Because tech mm -hmm. is... Uh, as broad as it can be right now, it's going to get even broader and it's going to get a little bit more complex with new technologies that get introduced, introduced which also means people are going to have their speciality, things that they really yeah. know to a T. And when you need to really figure out something with regards to that speciality, you can try and do as much research or get as much experience as you can by yourself. Uh, but it's going to be a long, long road ahead. And the easiest thing, that's also some advice someone gave me, if it takes you like four or five hours to research and you can figure it out usually, if you just mm -hmm. put your head down, get to working and try and figure this thing out, try every solution in the book, you you will figure it out usually. It's just going to take yeah. so, so long. Whereas if you can just ask one simple question for the guy that you probably know knows the answer or you can do it together yeah. and it saves you hours on hours, they say always ask. Always get to that and get to that person, ask that question and get it done together. Because productivity-wise, yeah. you're going to be more effective doing that, and you're probably going to learn mm -hmm. just as much. But it's so hard because then you feel like, yep. oh, why am I even here if he already knows the answer? And I'm just like, like, what's the point? Like, it's so hard sometimes to ask that question because you're like, then I'm just showing how little I actually know about this, mm. where he knows it off the top of his head, and I could sit over here and spend three, four hours of research and still not figure it out. Yeah. So there's also that, like, that's just such a mental game with trying to, to, you should ask questions. Absolutely. I always tell people to ask questions. Implementing that? Well, it's a little bit more <laughs> difficult than said. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it depends on the environment, right? And for me, it's easy yeah. because... Uh, I laid out, I came from operations, got into a junior developer role, and the expectation of me was, I don't know anything because this is my first time gig. So then me yeah. asking, for me, it was obvious that I didn't know. For them, it was obvious that I might not know. So I asked every mm -hmm. question in the book. I was like, what about this? And what about that? And when they didn't know, we would figure it out together. And I didn't feel opposed to asking those questions, but I do recognize that if the environment is different and when people say, oh, why don't you know that? And, and you get remarks like that, that can be really disheartening in that asking a follow-up question or asking questions at all. But then I would yeah. say that might not be the environment for you to kind of gain knowledge in and grow in because the environment needs to be, I mean, maybe it would be progressive, but it, it should allow you to grow and ask questions. If it's not the case, then it's not the environment for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that. But there still is... At least for me, maybe it's a pride thing it or an ego be. thing. I wanted to prove my worth, to, you know, make sure like, you know, they're getting what they, maybe it could also, you know, one of those developers that were on my team was kind of the owner of the company. So mm. maybe that also has something to do with it, <laughs> but they were always so helpful. Yeah. Never like, you know, talk down or anything like that. They just always helped regardless of, of what question, but they're still, I want to figure this out. I want to be the one to, to get it done and that like that makes not only me feel better like what did i said earlier that's like what coding is all about is like going through that barrier yourself and yep. figuring out yourself but at the end of the day you are part of a team you are there to get work done so you do need to have like efficiency and productivity in mind which also brings up another interesting point about uh the whole like working on my own projects versus working, you know, for someone else yeah. as, you know, as software engineer is that the, uh, the ability to go down a rabbit hole. And like I said, I love research and learn all of this stuff. You can't do that when you're like, like if it's a one hour task or two hour task, you can't, you 
can't spend four or five hours like learning everything you can about it. So like the next time it comes up, you know the answer to it or like you know where to look or you know more about it just in general. Like you, yep. you there's a little bit of time to research, but then it time to implement and it has to fit into that, you know, one to two hour window, however long that task, it could go over, right? Yep. Some tasks you may get done quicker so you can allot that time to other tasks. But that's something that is always kind of tricky because you want the developer working in your software engineering team to be as smart as possible, but you also want them to be as efficient as possible. And it's kind of like a double-edged sword where, well, as smart as possible, they'll research everything and learn everything. As efficient as possible, they won't. They'll, they'll you know, do some of the things that we talked about here. Yeah, implement. It's interesting. Yeah, uh, implement. Yeah, interesting. I mean, that was one of the points I was going to touch on because like working in a team, with time constraints, you always have time constraints for some reason. And it makes sense because yeah. a business is spending money, right? Just by virtue of paying salaries, paying mm. operational costs, they want value. And if you're in a team, if you're creating software, the software that you're cr creating, hopefully if the business case is solid, is gonna create value for the company, mm. which means there's gonna be time constraints. And there will always be a balance of, all right, what is my personal gain? How much personal knowledge do I gain from this? And what is my contribution towards the team output, right? It, it cannot be any other way because you have to balance that. Exactly as you mentioned, if you research for a day, people could be like, well, you could have just done this and this and then it would have been done, right? Then like, yeah, yeah. there's going to be those conversations. But for me then, uh -huh. if you love researching and I know you do right now, don't you have like a, a challenge in researching too much as well? Because at some point you still want to create the content that you want to create. Or are you like yeah. one of those people that don't doesn't put those boundaries on themselves? Because at the end of the day, they're boundaries you put on yourself. Yeah. I don't put strict boundaries. I don't like set, oh, this should take this many hours yeah. or whatever. But I do have a schedule in mind. Like I want to upload a video a week or I do want to get, you know, I have to get these things done this week, regardless of what I do, what day. It just needs to get done this week. So not necessarily strong, like like tight boundaries, even though that again would be more efficient. Yeah, I feel like it kind of puts a uh, a pressure on me that I don't need, exactly. that I don't want, and I'd rather just be able to kind of go with the flow and have fun doing it. Like if it takes literally, if it takes me in a, like twice the amount of time, but I enjoy that time. I, I don't, I don't see the issue. No, right. Obviously I have to make money and I have to make content and I have to, you know, I have to get things done. I understand that, but there's more benefit to me personally and overall. And I think it even comes across in my videos as well when I'm super like interested in a topic and I'm talking about that topic, whereas, as opposed to me just churning out a video yep. or if we were to talk about coding, me just churning out a project. There are some instances where like with coding and coding some of the stuff for the video, see that's mm. what takes a lot longer than even just researching like on Linux yeah. for the making of Linux video because of programming it, it, there's research involved, but there's also implementing involved. And then there's like the scripting involved because I have to tie in a story and make an uh, entertaining video about it. So there's a lot of that. And I do try to expedite that a little bit, but I never, give myself like tight time constraints. Uh, other than if I'm working with a sponsor, then mm. we'll have like a deadline, but I ensure that that deadline gives me more time than I think I need. Yeah. So I like that I'm a never, lot. I try to, I don't want to be rushed. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, so the strain you can put on yourself if you like want to uphold the schedule. And I feel like I have that with the podcast because I want to air weekly, but it's something mm, I decided yeah. to do and it's something I want to uphold and it doesn't have the amount of strain that it stresses me out. Like I, I can, mm. I would probably miss an episode if it needs to happen, if there's an emergency, if I get sick or whatnot. Hasn't happened yet and you put in the work to make sure it doesn't happen. But I get that if you allow yourself to just enjoy what this process and the leading up to the thing that you're gonna create, it's gonna be so much more sustainable, right? Because if you have tight deadline after deadline and the only person putting those deadlines on you is yourself, that is gonna be innate mm. stress and for some reason you're putting that on yourself, that's not gonna be sustainable because content creation, and especially working uh, not within a team, but you are the team, um, it needs to be sustainable for the long run because it's not gonna change unless you want it to. Yeah, and I've tried to take those practices uh, into, because I do kind of have a team now because mm. I do have uh, a couple editors. And again, I, I 
with the IBM PC, I did bring in someone to help with the research and the scripting, although I do love that portion of it. So yeah. it was just kind of like a test. I'm not sure if I'll may, uh, continue doing that. I always like make my own script after all the research, but just kind of to consolidate all the resources into one place to make my job easier or more efficient. Uh, I do try to be more lenient where, hey, I have a deadline here, but I'm trying to give you as much time as possible in between. It's not like, hey, I need this in two days. Unless I do, then I'll be like, hey, I, you know, maybe yeah. I'll compensate you differently. <laughs> I'll, you know, pay you more for, for expedited edit or something like that. But that's something I also try to keep in mind when I have people a part of my team because I know how I like to work. Yeah. Not everyone likes to... Not everyone likes to work that way, I, I'd i assume, but I do want to make sure that everyone, you know, who I work with is getting what they need, yeah. as in like sponsors, you know, they need it on a certain day. I try to make sure I adhere to that, but also that the people working on it, myself included, enjoy the process and aren't just doing it just to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can see how it can be challenging as well. And I'm going to take this podcast as an example I just got a runway to edit this episode uh, through an agency and the agency helps me. It's Ronnie in the back. He's doing the mm -hmm. uh, production usually and he's also going to edit the episodes. Now, there's not much editing involved other than this is where we start. This is where we end some audio mm -hmm. synchronization, some leveling. That's it. But I've done this for like the last 60, 70 episodes because another person used to do that and he's no longer involved in the podcast. But I think it's going to be an interesting dynamic because if you have done this process for a long, long time, just like you have with video and content creation and scripting, when it comes to the essence of your videos and someone else gets involved, you don't want to lose that sense of authenticity, right? And I'm 100% yeah. sure my podcast is going to be fine because there's not a lot of editing involved. But when it comes to things that are a bit more complex, complex edits, research involved, information that is going to be in there, I do feel like that can be an interesting dynamic working then in a team, whereas you were previously working by yourself. It, it, and it is very hard because a lot of, you know, obviously I make videos about computer science and software engineering, yeah. but how many editors know computer science and software engineering? Mm -hmm. So if I'm referencing like a certain type of terminal, like how will they know what to add? Or if I'm talking about some sort of like architecture, yeah. How are they going to know what visuals to add in there? So I did find myself like going deep into like the script and basically I go through and I source all of the resources, this image, uh, maybe recreate this type of diagram, um, add this here, show uh, this video or this image because it's applicable to what I'm talking about. Yeah. And that's how I've kind of found to make everything so smooth. It's 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 not where I can just record something and then send it off and it'll come back with maybe one or two edits afterwards. Mm -hmm. It needs more guidance because the knowledge gap is is different. It's not like just like a like a like a podcast or like a daily vlog even yeah. where like what's going on, like the video is about what's going on in the video. Like you can obviously see what's entertaining, what needs to be talked about, what may need to be cut out and kind of keep it chopped up like that. But when it comes to, you're talking about something technical, yeah. you need to break down that barrier so the editor or the team member can actually do their job. And that is something that I had to kind of figure out along the way. Yeah, I can imagine. So you need that like technical domain knowledge, the thing that you're talking about. Yeah. If there's an acronym mm -hmm. in there, and it's kind of pronounced in an odd way. Then <laughs> it can be so many options. <laughs> if someone doesn't yeah. know like anything, then they're gonna be like, "Man, this is a this is a tough one." What what image should I <laughs> add with regards to that? I've I've yeah. never thought of like workflows being established as a good pro in working as a team because you mentioned the workflow at the very beginning of this episode, working in sprints, picking up things or describing things in tasks, and then picking them up, putting them up for pull requests reviewing that and that's how it gets implemented in production. That's mm -hmm, more of an yeah. established workflow in a software engineering team. And sure, you have different variations and people are experimenting, but I recognized what you were saying. I could understand 100% of it because it's been one of my workflows also in the past. Now, mm -hmm. if you're more so trailblazing and doing things that other people are not doing, also in control yourself and you bring in other people, you're gonna have to establish a different way of working and that way of working is yeah. going to be completely custom, which means it's going to have to have 
a lot of time and iterations before you can actually be effective in that way as well. Yeah, and it's a fine balance between trying to see what other people are doing that are related to your field yeah. because there you know there are other plenty of YouTubers have their own teams, their own editors and and whatnot, but it's almost like each one does it differently. And mm. then of course with mine, I can't copy theirs because of what we just talked about with the technical barrier. So I need to do it a specific way. And I create my content in a particular way that I like to enjoy. Like there are some YouTubers who basically have the entire script written for them. Yep. They're only the talent. They talk to the camera and then they send it off. Like the script writer and the editor communicate with like B-roll and this edit and whatever needs to be done. And then they go from there, like they're just the talent, but I like to be more involved. I like to do the research. I need to break down that barrier to the editor. And it wasn't something that I had seen done before. Yeah. So I'm trying to take bits and pieces from the software engineering side and kind of keep things organized because the thing about like project management software issue tracking is that everything is centralized. Yeah. You can see what each person is working on when they're working on it. So like we're not working on the same task at the same time. And that is a very good thing that needs to be implemented across all teams, like everywhere, some form of that. So you know what everyone's working on at any given time and it just makes for better cohesion. But that's, it, I, I, I pulled some of those pieces and then tried to look at some of these other like YouTube teams or content creation teams or even film production like yeah. documentary makers. Like I just tried to pull from everywhere, but at the end of the day, like I can do as much pulling and research and trying to figure things out ahead of time as possible. You don't really learn until you start doing. Exactly. And then once you do, you're like, oh, that doesn't work for me or that does work for me. Or maybe I need to do this a little bit different. Like I said, I figured out that I need to source all the stuff and break down the technical barrier. Those are the things that you kind of figure out as you go along. And the same thing is something I say like, with people because I have a lot of new pro new programmers or computer science students who watch my content. Yeah. And that's what I say. It's like, there's a reason why tutorial hell is a thing. You're just being told to do something and you do it. You're not actually like critically thinking. You're not actually doing the, like you're coding yeah. by you're typing on a keyboard, but you're not programming, if you will. You know, if you want to try to distinguish those two terms, like coding is like, typing whereas like programming is writing a story yep. you're not writing the story you're being told what to type so until you actually write that story <laughs> is is when you really learn and when you figure those things out i think just trial and error not trying to be as efficient as possible and and whatnot is is kind of a good thing yeah because i have a problem of like analysis paralysis i'm working i want to build this project mm. But now I spend the next days at least trying to figure <laughs> out, oh, well, what framework, what language, what framework, what, uh, and when you're new, what tools do I use? Like, I don't even know what IDE yeah. to use. I don't know what, and all of these things, should I use this extension and that formatting and whatever, like just get started and figure that stuff around the way, uh, along the way. And it's easier said than done again, but it, it is what needs to be done. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. I mean, it's, it's something I've learned early on that my, like I would call it modus operandi, what I prefer is to experience through experiencing. And I'm not like you. I like the research, but to a certain degree, because at some point I'm like, I, I wish I just already had this knowledge because then I can work yeah, on there's creating the value, right? And I yeah. do find myself really enjoying researching certain topics, but at some point I feel like I need to add value. I need to like, produce something, experience what it is to do this in my use case and in my context. Because otherwise, I'm just one of those people that really knows the theory, but then kind of fails in practicality in that way. Yeah, there is. That's how I really felt, especially like, you know, when I when I graduated yeah. uh, from computer science, that's kind of what I felt. It's like I learned a lot of theory. I did learn a lot of programming, but there was like a imbalance to it, but there is that need for the understanding of theory and fundamentals and whatnot. So then you can take any language or framework or issue and 
figure out how to get it done because you do understand like those core principles and that foundation. Yeah. And what you said about like providing value reminds me of something I wanted to say earlier when we were talking about like between working in teams on like something big and just working on something for yourself is that when I was in high school, mm. I worked landscaping. And like we would go to houses or apartment complexes or whatever. So when I say landscape, I don't really mean lawn care. I mean like we did the entire landscape and every single tree and plant and garden and whatever that you see, that's what we did. All of the mulch, all of the dirt, all of everything. Even to the point of some like uh, terraforming, is that the right word where you like move earth? I think so. even, Even to the point of something, yeah, okay. Even to the point of something like that. And I always loved passing by the houses and places that I did. And regardless of who I'm with, I'm like, I did that yard over there. Yeah. I did that flower bed over there. I did all of, I did that. It's it. There's something about being able to say that you worked on something that can be appreciated by so many different people. Like there's something there. Whereas when you work on something like for yourself, me, luckily, I have like the outlet of being able to share it on YouTube and people get to see it over there, yeah. but maybe not necessarily use the software that I build, like the, you know, the Nerf gun in the face thing. Like, obviously, that's not something that like people are going to see. Like, I even took it apart. It was mainly because I thought it was a fun project and I wanted to make the video. People can enjoy the video, but not the software. So there is something about like that value add to somebody's life, whether it just be looking at a pretty landscaping as they drive by, or, you know, me working on a team at Netflix and say, hey, when I'm sitting watching Netflix with somebody, I actually implemented that feature there. Like, that's cool. I like those things. Whereas that's, that is something that I don't really get that much nowadays yeah it's the it's the sense of fulfillment right if you work your yes. ass off blood sweat and tears and then you have some result doesn't even matter what it is you want to show it to people mm-hmm. and be like listen i worked my ass off for this look at it yeah. this is the result and it doesn't matter yeah, what it 100%. is like just having that conversation and if the the opposite person is a, a real good friend uh, a real good person they'll be like that's amazing and it will it will make yeah. you feel out of this world basically i i recognize that 100 <laughs> percent yeah absolutely so that is another definite like upside to to working on something that you know other people will enjoy yeah cool man i've uh i've really enjoyed this conversation it took a completely different spin than i imagine it would like some episodes (laughs) do but this was a lot of fun man thank you so much for coming on before we leave off is there anything you'd still like to share with our audience Hmm. no just most of your audience would be what Software engineers of what skill level? Um, if I look at the demographics, they're between like 18 and 34, which is a big demographic and I have no clue what like yeah. job they have. But I would assume they're somewhere involved in creating software. If that's a software engineer or a product owner or a designer, okay. doesn't really matter. Well, this, this may be coming late in the episode. <laughs> Some people are already worried about what I said earlier, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm not trying to scare people with saying that I think AI will cause programming jobs to decline. That, don't 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 get scared you have the ability to learn things if you can learn coding so you'll be fine don't worry about <laughs> it <laughs> at the very very end <laughs> at the very very end while they're sweating the entire episode yeah. like, no <laughs> exactly. click, they've already applied to away, five man. jobs yeah. while listening <laughs> cool man i'm gonna round it off here thank you so much for coming on forest i'm gonna put all forest's socials in the description below check them out first night Let them know you came from our show. And with that being said, thank you for listening. We'll see you on the next one.